Okay, so this, uh, this weekend we'll be looking at uh, some stories from Genesis and uh, looking at uh, how these um, different stories about restoring the, what went wrong at the fall. Uh, that uh, because of the fall, then all human relationships became corrupted. Relationships in men and women, husbands and wives, brothers and brothers, sisters and sisters, all these parents and children, all these relationships became corrupted. And how normally, when we're looking at, through the principle, mostly focusing upon the Cain Abel relationship, which I look at this afternoon, but uh, we've been looking at these, uh, some of these other ones. So this morning we looked at looking at parent child relationship. So earlier on we looked at the Ham Noah relationship. So now we want to look at what was going on with the Abraham Isaac relationship. Does anybody find and just to remind you again what restoration is? Restoration occurs when you find yourself in a similar position to Adam, Eve, the Archangel, Cain, Abel, or any historical figure or person in your ancestry, and you have to face the same temptation to make the same mistake that they did and continue the pattern of fallen history. But you choose not to do so, and instead of acting out of your fallen nature, you act according to your original nature, and you break the cycle of abuse by following your conscience. So what I want to look at now is the parent-child relationship through the lens of what was going on here between Abraham and Isaac. Does anybody find this a shocking story? Yes. yes. Why is it a shocking story? Well, you kill your own child. Well, you didn't actually kill him. But no. <laughs> he was prepared to. He's, okay, he was prepared to. Yeah. What else is shocking about this story? Abraham was willing to put his son to death. Anything else shocking? Isaac. Uh, God asked him to do it. That's mm -hmm. shocking. And Isaac kind of tagging along. You know? Isaac was I willing. Isaac was willing to go along with it. <sighs> this is the founding story of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So what's going on here? Yeah. It's a really powerful, shocking story, but actually this is the core story of our faith. So what is restoration all about? Change of lineage. Okay. So the whole purpose of restoration is to do with the change of lineage. What is change of lineage about? When you're changing your lineage, what are you changing? Parent-child relationship. Yeah. God. Your heart. Your heart. What is your lineage? Satan. Cutting off from Satan. Yeah. What does that mean <laughs> substantially? <laughs> What's going on inside here? Okay. Our, our lineage. Well, I have parents, grandparents, great-grandparents. This is all the way back, and then into the future, I got children. One day, I have grandchildren, etc. So that's the lineage. It's a sort of line of genetic, physical aspect to it, but also there's a pattern of behaviour and responses and a certain way of living, a way of life, as, as part of our lineage. But also, in terms of our identity, we conceptualise ourselves, who I am, through the relationships we have with our parents. These are my parents, from the, the interaction I have with my parents, my brothers and sisters, this is the way through which I form my identity of who I am. So what should be the core of our identity? I'm the son of God. Yes, I'm the son of God. I'm the daughter of God. Yeah, I'm the son of God. So, you know, if, if, you're, if your dad's the president of, of, of a country or president of a company, you go, right, I'm so proud of my dad, he's the president of America. We own this huge company, all this incredible business, yes? That's the source of a person's pride. Their identity comes from that. But I, our real identity, core of identity, should come from our relationship with God. What's Liliane? Can't you hear? Can I speak louder? Oh, I'm sorry. That's really embarrassing to say to a teacher, could you speak louder? <laughs> I need to project my voice more. That's all. Sorry. Um, is that better? Yes. Okay. 
All right, so core of identity should be that. If Adam and Eve had grown up and become mature and become one with God, they would have felt God's love in every single cell of their body. They'd have felt, I'm the son, I'm the daughter of God. That is who I am. And God created this incredible world for me to live in and, and to enjoy. Yes? But because of the fall, did Adam and Eve, were Adam and Eve still God's children? Were they or weren't they? No. Yes, they were. They were still God's children. But did they feel like they were God's children? No. no. Did they feel God's love? No. Did God still love them just as much as he did before? Yes. Yes, God still loved them. They were still God's children. But they couldn't feel God's love because of what they had done created a barrier between them and God. And they, weren't, they didn't own up and confess. They felt ashamed. They cut themselves off from God. Because they no longer, and they couldn't feel God's love because they didn't feel worthy of God's love. Yeah? They didn't feel like they deserved to be loved by God. Even though God still loves them, they couldn't feel that love because they didn't feel worthy of God's love. Just like with us, sometimes, you know, we think, oh, if that person really knew what I was thinking, they wouldn't love us or they wouldn't like us, etc., etc. Yes? And that's often the way it works. We know that person, our parents love us. But well, we sometimes we think if they really knew what I was thinking and feeling and what I'd done with my life. <laughs> yes, I mean? That's the way Satan does that. Yeah? Okay. So Adam and Eve, then after the fall, they no longer felt like they were God's son and daughter. They had this confused sense of identity, and so they found their identity in something else. What we we're talking about before, idol worship, find their identity in the nationality, all these sorts of things. And that sense became part of Satan's lineage. Is a sort of metaphorical way of saying they didn't find their identity in their relationship with God. They no longer were their true self. Anyway, if you go to Chompion, what's the motto for Chompion? Slush. What does that yellow book have in search of our true self? Yeah? So that's what it is. So change of lineage then is about change your identity from, oh, this is who I am, to actually the core of my identity is I am the son or daughter of God. So all these stories then are connected to the change of lineage, which was lost at the fall. How is that story connected to that? What's going on here at a deeper level? I, for me, it's, I hated teaching the story until recently. Yeah? Because I couldn't, because it didn't work for me. This horrendous thing that God asked Abraham to do this horrendous thing that Abraham was willing to do. And um, my God, what was Isaac thinking? Why didn't he get on the phone and phone up the social services and say, <laughs> child abuse, <laughs> please send a social worker along to rescue me, please. <laughs> what was really going on? Okay, so, as it says here, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here am I, and he said, take your son, your only son Isaac, you know, emphasis, your only son Isaac, who you love, making it more and more intense, and offer him as a burnt offering. So Abraham rose early in the morning. <coughs> Abraham didn't think, well, I'm going to sleep in tonight, this morning. He got up early in the morning and he went to do this. Kind of shocking, really. So what was this? It says here it was a test. Why did God test Abraham? What is it, what's, the, what's the purpose of a test? Qualify. See if you're qualified. Okay. That you're worthy. If you're worthy. Do you think God if do you think God knew? Okay, so it's interesting. In Hebrew, the word test and miracle are the same word. So how can a test be a miracle? It changes. Changes something. That's how does a test change something? Well, if you succeed, then, uh, okay, it changes. That's right. When you succeed, something with inside you changes. So, for example, you know, if you go along to a swimming pool and they have these these diving boards, and the very highest one, you could think, oh, I'd like to jump, dive off there, but you feel kind of, you know. So you sit, you watch people climbing up, diving off climbing up, jumping off, and you notice not a single person breaks their neck or breaks their leg, not a single person drowns, yes? And you think, I want to do that, I'm going to do that. And you climb up, 
and you look over the edge and <laughs> what? <laughs> so what's going on here? Yeah. You're afraid, but is this fear rational or irrational? Irrational. <coughs> hmm? irrational. It's irrational. You know that you won't drown. You know that you won't die. You know you won't break your neck or your leg because you've seen a hundred other people doing it, yes? But when you're there, there's all kinds of internal barriers, aren't there? All kinds of fears, yes? And it's really difficult <coughs> the first time you do it. <coughs> but the first time you do it, how do you feel? Victorious. Victorious, incredibly ecstatic. And what do you do next? You do it again. You do it again, don't you? <laughs> and you do it again and again and again, yes? Because you've broken through this inner barrier, yes? So it's like a miracle, you've gone from one level to another level. You become a different person. So the purpose of a test isn't to find out, are you qualified? Often the purpose of a test is to help you to move from this stage, this level, onto that level. And so that when God tests us, it's to give us the opportunity and the challenge to break through the internal barriers and fears that we have and to break our concepts so we can move from where we are to the next level. And so sometimes when you do something which you think is impossible, you feel amazing. That was, like a, that was like a miracle. I could not, I did not believe it was possible for me to do that. Yes? That's the way it works, isn't it? So that's what's going on here. When God is testing Abraham, he's not trying to see if he's going to pass or fail. He's putting Abraham in a situation where Abraham can move on in his own spiritual development onto the next level. That make sense? Yes. Okay. So... That's what it's about. So Abraham up until then had passed nine tests. I told you a couple of them yesterday, but there were other ones as well. So sacrificing Isaac then is contrary to everything he believed. Against everything he believed was right. Yes? And the idea, well, you know, God said that through Isaac you're going to have all these children, your descendants will number the stars of heaven. So by doing this, it was against everything he believed was right and true. So the question is then, why did he do it? And why did Isaac go along with it? So why did Abraham do it then? Why did Isaac go along with it? They didn't believe that he would have to do it. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's why, why took, that's why the angel didn't come till the very last moment. Yeah. So... Different ways, so this is, a, this is the thing, how do you explain what's going on here? One way is saying, well, the call from Abraham, the call of one's being, lies not in the self, but in the commitment to the Creator. Well, because God asked me to do it, then I will do it. That's what sometimes people say. It's God's will, therefore, even though I think it's unethical and it's wrong, and I cannot understand it, because God asked me to do it, I'm going to do it anyway. Okay? That's one way of approaching it. But... Yeah. The Bible says Abraham was chosen to be a role model. God said, For I've chosen him <coughs> so that he will instruct his children, <coughs> that's us, and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. So, do we regard Abraham and what he did here as a role model for how we should behave? <laughs> Not that particular. <laughs> but this is a core. This act is a core act of our faith. So, should we be doing what should we be? How does this work in practice? How is this event, what has this event got to do with me, with my life, with our community, with the world in which we're living? It's really important. Yeah? Forget yourself. Okay. Kierkegaard. People have tried to explain this. Kierkegaard, he uh, lived just a bit further south from here. <laughs> and um, he said, he talked about this, wrote this book, an interesting book, and uh, he talked about the teleological suspension of the ethical. Teleological means because there's a purpose, then you can suspend the ethical. In other words, you can do things which normally regard as being unethical, illegal, and immoral because you're doing it for some higher purpose. Yeah? for God's will. So this is the willingness, he said, to let the I-thou, you know, God, me, relationship, 
the love of God to overrule the universal principles of buying human beings to one another. Because of my love for God, this means, because of Abraham's love for God, that meant that it was the right thing to do to sacrifice Isaac. Do you like that idea? Not really, no. <laughs> So these are, these are, this, is, you know, this is a real thing that people struggle. How do you explain what's going on here? How do you justify what Abraham is willing to do from an ethical perspective and a moral perspective? So what Kierkegaard is arguing for here, which is many ways in which people interpret it, that God's will means that anything at the end of the day is justifiable. This is the logic of the religious fanatic, the inquisitor, and the suicide bomber the people who go around blowing themselves up, sacrificing themselves for God's will, and the, the mothers who go around persuading, encouraging their children to become suicide bombers, so they're sacrificing their children for God's will, and they think that by going and committing these kind of acts, they're going to go to heaven or paradise. Yeah? Or the religious fanatic who went, the Catholics who went and got the, the thumb screws and tortured people to save that person's soul. Is that that's one way of interpreting the story. Mm -hmm. If you say that God's will means that it's okay to break the law, it's okay to un act unethically or immorally, that is where you end up. Okay. So does God ever ask us to be unethical? No. I mean, this is a very typical father-son relationship. Mm -hmm. I must borrow from him, so if he want, <coughs> I, I give my life for him. Okay. But does God ever ask us to do something which is unethical and wrong? Well, this has nothing to do with unethical. Father won't. I understand. That's a particular cultural, moral framework which one is working in. But I want to see, is that the biblical framework? I hope not. Well, that's what we're trying to explore. <laughs> it's a really important thing, this parent-child relationship. What is going on here? It's really fundamental you know, to understand how, you know, what this story means. So I should just understand, God does not ask us to be unethical. God does not ask us to do anything that is wrong. So, what did Father teach? We should follow what? Conscience. Conscience, yeah. conscience is the highest thing. Yeah. We should follow our conscience before God, our parents, etc. doesn't mean we should, shouldn't do what our parents ask us to do. So, who, who, you know, if you don't tidy your bedroom up, who reminds you to tidy your bedroom up first? No, before, no, who reminds you first? Your conscience. Your conscience. <laughs> your Mama is the conscience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my wife is my conscience as well. <laughs> your conscience reminds you. If, you're con if you don't listen to your conscience, then your mum or your wife or your husband reminds you, or somebody reminds you. Okay? So that's why, con that's why you know, I said. I remember once I had my, one of my sons who couldn't get him out of bed in the morning, so I nagged him. I said, look, if you just do what you're supposed to do, then I'll never have to, you never need to listen to me ever again. I said, if you just follow your conscience, then you'll never have to listen to your parents ever again. Because all your parents do, I said, is tell you what you should be doing anyway. But if you just listen to your conscience, then, and he thought, oh, true. And if I follow my conscience, I never need to do, listen to my parents again. And that became great. <laughs> so he just listens to his conscience. I don't never need to remind him any more about his homework or this or that. Or the other. He just did it, and so he doesn't get nagged anymore. Okay, so God doesn't ask us to be unethical. The whole point is God wants us to live according to law, fulfill. The, you know, there's no point where God asks people to do things which are unethical or immoral. Sometimes people bring up certain stories, but that's because they need to understand these stories at a deeper level. So there has to be another way of looking at it. This is really serious. It's about the change of lineage. Yeah? It's very serious. Yeah? What's going on here? Okay, so if we look at the world in which Abraham lived, what God was doing was challenging the satanic tradition. God was challenging the fallen world. All the fallen traditions and patterns of behavior that existed within the family in the ancient world God was challenging all these and trying to change and restore the fallen family to the way it was supposed to be. And through this event, he was challenging the fallen relationship between parents and children and moving it to the way it was supposed to be. 
So if we look at the ancient world, and the family in the ancient world, it's like this. There was a domestic religion, and so everybody had their own little, you know, altars with their little idols on the altars, and they'd light incense to the idols, and they'd worship them. It was called the gods of the hearth. So all the Romans, they had their little gods of the hearth, and their little idols that they bowed down and worshipped. So religion then was domestic, it was based upon the family, and people used to worship their ancestors, and they would, uh, you know, that was their relationship, worship their ancestors, and people also used to practice child sacrifice. They used to sacrifice their children in the ancient world. It was normal, until very recently in many parts of society, it was normal. Why would people sacrifice their children? Giving what most precious to God. That's right. People did sacrifice their children out of a good heart and motivation, as a way of demonstrating their heart and love for God. They wanted to give to God that which was most precious to them, so they sacrificed their children. So child sacrifice was it done with a good motivation or a bad motivation? Good motivation, as a way of expressing their heart and their love for God. But from God's point of view, how did He see it? Did God like his children being sacrificed? Did God like child sacrifice? No. No. Okay, so this was this went on for years, generations, centuries. People think, oh, why was sac you know, oh it's amazing, Abraham has so much faith, he's willing to sacrifice his child. That was normal. In the ancient world, sacrificing your children was normal. That's what they did. God wanted to break this and stop this from taking place. So that was that's what it was. Also, in the ancient world, the head of the family had absolute authority. So the head of the family was the father, the husband, and so the head of the family had power of life and death over his wife and children. In the ancient world, a man could put his wife to death, and it was not against the law. He could, he had the authority to put his children to death. Why could a, a man, a husband and father, put his wife or his children to death? Why could he do that? What allowed him to do that? Because he owned them. They were his property. Yes? They, a man, owned his wife and his children. So of course, because they were his personal property, he could do with them whatever he chose, which could include sacrificing them and putting them to death. And then when, and that in the Roman law, this is called patria potestas, and both of these powers and authority was inherited by the firstborn son. Firstborn son, when his dad died, if he wanted to, he had the right and the authority to put his mother to death. Is this the way it's supposed to be? No. no. Which, which world is this? This is Satan's world. This is the pattern of behavior within a family and the structures of power and authority that existed in the ancient world. This is the kind of world which is created through the fall. How long has that world carried on till? Until It started changing. Okay, I don't know about Sweden, but in Britain, when in the 19th century, when a rich woman married, got married, what happened to her property? It came to her <coughs> husband. Until, very, until the 20th century, about 50 years ago, if a woman wanted to open a bank account, what did she need? Hmm? Permission from her. If she's married, she needed her husband's permission. If she wasn't married, she needed her father's permission. Why? Because of this whole thing. This whole thing has been carrying on for thousands of years, yes? And gradually been eradicated and gradually been changed. So all these things that have been happening in relatively recently, it's all part of this whole process of the change of lineage and the change of identity. Yeah, so people shouldn't belong to somebody else. So the biblical tradition then, it rejects all of the above as pagan. All these traditions from the ancient world are all pagan. They're all wrong. They're all the product of the fall. Every single one of them that God wanted to challenge and change. And it started with Abraham. And so child sacrifice then is regarded as the worst sin. No, not the worst sin, it's probably about the second worst sin in the Bible. <clears throat> so as I said here, over and over again it's condemned. Any of the people of Israel, or of the aliens who reside in Israel, 
who give any of their offspring to Molech, so this is an idol, that one of the ancient gods, pagan gods, <laughs> shall be put to death. The people of the land shall stone them to death. I myself have set my face against them and will cut them off from the people because they have given of their offspring to Molech, defiling my sanctuary and profaning my holy name. So, oh, so for God then, child sacrifice is the worst crime. Yeah? So what is the biblical worldview then? The biblical worldview is like this. <clears throat> First of all, you don't worship. There's, in, the Bible is the only ancient scripture where there's no ancestor worship at all. No ancestor worship. <clears throat> because in the biblical tradition, you worship God. Worship the God of all humanity. So this is the idea that actually every single human being is a son or daughter of God. And so God is the God of all human beings. You're not just the God of the Jews, but the God of all humanity. And so people then, they don't worship ancestors, they worship the God of all humanity. <coughs> and so there are no sacrifices of dead ancestors. <coughs> and so also the biblical tradition is that father and mother have equal authority. So again, page one in Genesis, God created man in his image and likeness, male and female, he created them. In the Ten Commandments, you honor your father and your mother. So within the family, man and woman, husband and wife, father and mother have equal authority. Okay? So that means it's completely different to the Roman tradition, completely different to the patriarchal tradition where the man was the head of the family. Yeah? This goes all the way back to page one of Genesis. This attempt to change the whole of society, to change, reverse what happened at the fall, where the archangel came to dominate everything and men developed the archangelic nature, wanting to own and control women. Yeah. <coughs> so parents then, <coughs> so parents then are guardians, not owners. So this ancestor business, when you go to the spiritual world, the spiritual world is very flat. There are no hierarchies of ancestors in the spiritual world. The spiritual world is very flat. Why? In the spiritual world, everybody is a son or daughter of God. In the spiritual world, everyone has become a mature adult. When you meet your parents or great -par or grandparents or great great grandparents in the spiritual world, they're all on the same level because you all become a son. You're all a son or daughter of God. It's very very flat. There's equality. So the biblical tradition is very egalitarian. Yes, everyone has their own personal relationship with God. Nobody needs to have a mediator between them and God. Everyone is very it's very very flat, very egalitarian. So that's why equality is a very important value in the biblical tradition. And so that's why they wouldn't worship ancestors, they don't believe that there's the hierarchy in the spiritual world, the spiritual world is very flat, and they only worship God. <coughs> Parents then are guardians, so that means then every, son, every child is a son or daughter of God. That means that God, every human being belongs to God. So that means parents don't own their children, Children are a gift from God. We have children. We give birth to God's children. So in that sense, we're the guardians. We're the ones who are there or here to look after God's children. Because every person is a son or daughter of God. So that means then, every individual has divine, unique, eternal value. Now this whole understanding of human rights, you know, become kind of current now, it goes back 4,000 years, for this understanding every human being is a son or daughter of God, everyone that has divine, unique, individual, and eternal value. So what God is asking Abraham to do is to renounce his ownership of Isaac. So when God said to Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son, your only son, the son that you love, and from whom all your, answer, all your descendants are going to come, I want you to sacrifice him to me as a burnt offering. What could Abraham have said? What could he have said? No. <laughs> yeah. And, okay, he could have said no. But what reason would he have given to God? My property. My property. This is my son. You can't, he's my son. You can't ask me to sacrifice my son. He's mine. Yes? Okay? That's the ancient world. You can only sacrifice your child if you own your child. That child is your property. So Abraham could have responded to God and said, No, God, I'm not going to sacrifice him. I love him. The only one of God. You can't ask me to do this because he belongs to me. You don't have the right to ask me to sacrifice my son. You understand? 
that what God is asking Abraham to do is to actually renounce his ownership of Isaac and to recognize, actually, Isaac is not my son. Actually, Isaac is God's son. So because Isaac is God's son, then God has the authority to ask me or tell me to sacrifice him. Do you understand? It's this whole thing going on here. So Abraham is put in this incredibly challenging situation of having to accept and to recognize, yes, Isaac is the son of God. Before he's my son, he's God's son, and therefore God has the authority to ask me to do that. Does that make sense? So children then are not the property of their parents, children are the property of God. Does that make sense? Yes? Your son. Then it would stop. God. If he told, if he said to God, "I'm not going to sacrifice," sorry. I'm not going to sacrifice. This is your son, God. He's not my son. Yes. Well, he's um, your son. I cannot do that, God. Well, but but that's the point because yeah. because God says do it. Yeah. Do he, he has to do it? Well, of course, because it's not his son; it's God's son. So if God wants Abraham to sacrifice his son, then <laughs> Abraham will be doing that. No, no, it's the other way around. If Isaac was Abraham's son, he can sacrifice him. But if he's God's son, he cannot sacrifice yeah, him. But, but, it's not then, up to him to decide. But exactly. It's God's son. Yeah, so, but, but if God tells Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, then I, Abraham has to do that. Abraham, do you think Abraham thought it's the right thing to do? No. Well, if he didn't think it's the right thing to do, why would he have done it? Uh, there's something fishy. <laughs> <laughs> that is. Okay. Okay. Something is not right. Okay. Right. What, what does Talmud say? Does it have some <laughs> explanation about? Okay. Who, what, okay. When God said, when God called Abraham, the made a covenant. God said to Abraham, "Walk before me, and be blameless." Now God didn't say to Abraham, "Follow me." Because God isn't interested in followers. God said to Abraham, walk before me and be blameless. In other words, do follow your conscience. And if you follow your conscience, you'll always know what the right thing to do is. And so when God said to Abraham, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, did Abraham think it's the right thing to do or the wrong thing? He thought, God, how, you know, that's the wrong thing to do. Shouldn't the, the judge of the world do justice? It's not fair to put all these people to death. There may be some innocent people there as well. How can you put the innocent to death together with the guilty? And so Abraham then felt, this is unfair, this is unjust, and he argued with God. And he worked it all the way down to ten good people. How many people are willing to argue with God? So he was a very righteous person. He wasn't afraid of arguing with God, because for him, his conscience is so important, an incredibly strong sense of justice. So when God told him to sacrifice Isaac, did his conscience tell him it was the right thing to do or the wrong thing? If he, if he thought it was the wrong thing to do, he wouldn't have done it. And he didn't. Well, he, he was willing to do it. Well, and if maybe he, he was, maybe, it's not an angel to maybe it's his own conscience telling him, I'm not going to do it. Maybe the story is... Okay, so on the Talmud, okay, the Talmud then is a conversation, and lots of rabbis have lots of different ideas. Okay, so some say, well, Abraham, you know, shouldn't have done it. And then God got, you know, had to intervene at the last moment to stop him doing something so stupid. That's that one way of looking at it. So Abraham failed by being willing to do it. Um, anyway, there are lots of different, in the time with lots of different interpretations. This is one particular one. This is the one I think that works for me. Because it's Isaac about... has done something wrong. Sorry? Yeah, Isaac must have done something wrong, but Abraham knows. Isaac did something wrong? No. I don't think so. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it's trying to work, it's a, for me, the core idea is, the core idea here is to do with the change of lineage, okay? Change of lineage is, trans, is, is changing from, I, to, to the point where people recognize, I am the son or daughter of God, yes? And this is the fall, so it's, so change of lineage then, another way of looking at it, as a metaphor, is a change of ownership. Instead of a father owning his wife and a father owning his children and being, having authority to put them to death, 
changeable lineage is change of ownership where you recognize my wife is not my property. She has her own individual rights. She is a daughter of God. I need to treat her as God's daughter and love her and care for her and treat her with a lot of respect. My children are not my property. They are God's children. My duty is to look after and love them, take care of them, etc., etc., on behalf of God. And through this, I can experience and inherit God's love. So change of lineage, then, in that sense, is like a change of ownership. To recognize my wife and my children don't belong to me. They belong to God, yes? So it's a change of identity. Yeah? Oh, my identity comes from my relationship with God much more than it does from my relationship with my parents, my country, or whatever else. That makes sense? Yeah. I'm trying to wrestle with these things myself. I don't know. To be honest, if you agree, and I said to you yesterday, if you accept I agree with everything I say, I'd be really surprised and very disappointed. I'm just trying to throw <laughs> lots of stuff out there to get you to think, yeah? To think about these things differently, to wrestle with this really important event. What does it really mean? What's it really about? Was God that told Abraham, your descendant will be man, right? Your descendants what? Will be many. There's an image, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, who would these descendants come through? Well, uh, His son. Yes. So, you know, so he, he, okay, your descendants will be as many as the stars. So, so if, it, if I kill my son, your son, where do they come from? He could have wrestled with that issue as well, right? I'm sure he wrestled with lots of things, but at the end of the day, Abraham came to the conclusion, Isaac belongs to God. If this is what God wants to do, or God wants me to do with his son, I will do it, because he's not my son, he's God's son. So at the end of the day, that became like the final thing. This boy of mine, who I love with all my heart, that I've waited for for you know, all these years, at the end of the day, this son of mine is not mine, it's not my personal property, my possession, at the end of the day is God's. It was like an incredible life and death situation. So when I read out yesterday, Father, where, Father said, where does the change of blood, blood lineage take place? The change of lineage takes place when people go through a life and death situation for the future dignity of man. Remember that quote? Yes. Okay. So what Abraham's doing here, he's going, th and Isaac, they're both going through a life and death situation for the future dignity of man. The future dignity of man is to p take people from being the possession of their parents <coughs> to being the son and daughter of God, with the dignity of being the son and daughter of God, with having individual, unique, divine, eternal value. Yes, which m nowadays is translated, the world caught up with this, and now it's called human rights, yeah? But this, is, this principle was established 4,000 years ago. That everything good we find in the world in which we live comes from this event, this recognition that every single person has divine value and therefore has to be treated with respect. Therefore, you cannot own a human being. The, end, the abolition of slavery starts with this event. Nobody has the right to own another human being because every human being belongs to God. How can you own a person? when this person is, belongs to God. You can't do it. You can employ them, but you can't own them. You know what I mean? <coughs> this, this, the abolition of slavery started from this event. This, it's from this event that the value of the individual came into the world. Yes? The recognition that every individual, the son and daughter of God, has individual, divine, eternal value. It's a most extraordinary thing that Abraham went through willing to, yes, to recognize that. But also for Isaac, you know, to go to Isaac. Yeah. So we think about this, you know, there's Abraham who would do this. Um, Sarah, the Talmud says that Sarah, when she found out what Abraham's going to do to her son, she died of shock. <sighs> you can imagine. Okay, so this is interesting. When Eve first gives birth, Eve says, with the help of the Lord, I've acquired a, a man. The word acquired, kaniti, in Hebrew, means that. So, Eve said, my son is my possession. I own Cain. I possess him. Now, what, hap what happens when mothers are very, very possessive? Not good. Not good. What, what do children do? Often they rebel. Yeah? 
But that was how that was the fallen tradition. Eve thought these children are my children; I own them. Yes, very very powerful maternal instinct. Yes, and so Eve then was a very very possessive mother. Again, Sarah then had to go through a similar situation. Could she do this? Could she bear to surrender Isaac, her son, at that age? Yeah? You can imagine the incredible stuff, turmoil that Sarah herself must have been going through. You know, maybe, she, maybe that's why she didn't go with Abraham to do this. Maybe it's unbearable for her to, you know, to actually do this. You know what I mean? It's really powerful stuff going on here. Where is that quote from? Which? The you. Genesis. You know, like, well, yeah, yes. I mean, when Eve has a son, then this is what it says in English. <laughs> with the help of the, with English, it says, "With the help of the Lord, I have acquired a man," yes. and she calls him Cain. The word, the meaning Cain. of the word Cain, is from the Hebrew. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I need to grow. I need to grow a bit more. Sorry. <laughs> is that's what it means? I have acquired. I this. You know. I own a son. This is my son. He belongs to me. And that was a whole tradition from the fall of parents owning their children. And then that meant if you own your children, that means you have the right to sacrifice them. So that became the basis for child sacrifice. So restoration then is changing this lineage, fallen lineage, and changing it from human beings owning each other to recognizing every human being as a son and daughter of God and belongs to God. That that is the core of our lineage and our identity is that. And so for Isaac also, what do you think was going on with him? Why didn't he get on the phone? Why didn't he run away? He could have said, you know, this is my life. You can't sacrifice my life. I can't be sacrificed. This is my life. Nobody asked me. I own myself. So what was Isaac having to do in this situation? He was having to recognize what? that he didn't own himself, he was actually owned by God. God owned him. He was God's son, God's daughter. So that was why God could ask Abraham to do this. Isaac maybe thought, well, I don't know why God's asked, God needs me to be sacrificed. I have no idea. Maybe it's for something which I cannot understand. Maybe it's necessary for God's providence. He trusted Abraham, he knew Abraham was a prophet of God, that Abraham would never do the wrong thing. Abraham always followed and went, followed his conscience. And so he believed his father, he trusted his father, he couldn't understand why it was necessary. But at the end of the day, Isaac must have also changed his lineage from being a selfish person to actually, I belong to God. Yeah. And so in that sense, it's okay for this to go and happen. It really is difficult stuff to process and deal with. And so when second gen here, what happened to you? Do you remember what happened to you when you were eight days old? <laughs> <laughs> well, do you remember what happened to maybe your younger brothers or sisters when they were eight days old? Hmm? What happened? Eight, eight day ceremony where parents do what? Dedicate the children to God. Yeah, that's the core of that tradition comes from here. To re this recognition that my, these children are not my children, they're God's children. So dedicated to God, these are God's children and my responsibility, my duty is to take care of my children. To look after my children, to love my children, these children, on, to love God's children on God's behalf. Because God doesn't have a body. Yeah? And then through that we can inherit God's love, and experience God's love. So the responsibility of parents then is not to sacrifice their children because children do not belong to their parents. The responsibility of parents is to take care of their children, look after their children, for, because they're God's children, need to be looked after and taken care of to help them fulfill their, you know, uh, their, their potential and all these different things. That make sense? So we can't sacrifice our children. So, you know, we talked about yesterday how some of these stories have been mistold or misused in our own spiritual community. And I think this is also one of these stories which has been mistold and misused. You know, people are encouraged to sacrifice with Isaac, but actually that's a complete misunderstanding of the story. The real meaning of the story is completely different, I think, to the way we've understood it before. It's to do with change of lineage, change of identity, 
and recognizing you know, the real relationship between parents and children, um, such that you know, we don't have the authority to sacrifice our children. We only have the responsibility to take care of them and look after them on God's behalf. That makes sense? Yeah. And these are things I think we made, you know, we got wrong sometimes in our own spiritual community. <sighs> things I really got wrong myself. Ah, oh, I've got to go and do God's will. Leave my pet children behind. Ah, oh, sorry, I can't afford your education. But I've got to go and give money to do this or that or the other. You know what I mean? Happens at night. I realize myself, I've often done things. So, you know, do you think Isaac is willing to go along with this? Abraham wasn't forcing him. Abraham is an old man. You know, Isaac was a teenager, he could have easily run away or whatever. So Abraham then must have asked God, must have asked Isaac, is it okay? Yes? So I realized myself before I go off on you know, get on a plane to Stockholm or somewhere, first I need to go and ask my children, is it okay if I leave them for the weekend and I go there? As opposed to, oh, it's God's will, I have to go there and sacrifice you. <laughs> You know what I mean? I mean? That's what it means, I think, to get one's niece, to get one's parents, <coughs> one's, <coughs> one's wives, one's children's support. Yes, it's okay, please go there, Daddy, and then there, there. <coughs> and, you know, it's really important to have one's spouses and one's children's support on what one is doing. So one shouldn't be sacrificing them, but actually one should be only doing things with their support and with their permission in that sense. Does that make sense? I'm sure I'm supposed to stop at some point, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there's one other thing, just the last final thing. This is a beautiful poem which expresses this all very well by someone called Khalil Gebran from Lebanon. <clears throat> he says, your children are not your children. They're the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. And though they're with you, yet they belong not to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls, for their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you, for life goes not backward, nor tarries with yesterday. You are the bows from which your children, as living arrows, are sent forth. The archer sees the mark upon the path of the infinite, and he bends you with his might, that his arrows may go swift and far. Let your bending in the archer's hand be for gladness, for even as he loves the arrow that flies, so he loves also the bow that is stable. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs>